of the gospel of Matthew. Here we are in uh, Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> and today, in, in this uh, series, as we've taken almost about a year to that, but we're working through it, this is really the last final section of the Gospel of, of Matthew. And, and you'll notice that what we see here in the text, we also have recorded uh, also in Mark and Luke, and uh, uh, particularly even John, all the Gospels talk this event and in the last week of Jesus's life. But in all the Gospels, including Matthew, there is a disproportionate amount of time that is spent only on this last week. In John's Gospel, even more. Half of the Gospel of John is devoted to just seven days of the ministry of Jesus. A quarter of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are devoted to that very point because the Gospel writers are not just much interested in giving you a biography of Jesus, a biopic of his life. If they were writing a biography, or if you and I were editing a biography, we would want that biographer to tell us a whole lot more about certain things in Jesus' life. But these gospel writers are writing more than a biography. They're writing a gospel. And a gospel in particular is to set before us two very fundamental, important things. When you read the Bible, you read the gospels, they tell you two specific things. This is why they wrote them. Who is Christ? Who is Jesus? And what did he do? Famous commentators, writers would call this the person and the work of Christ. That's their focus. So as we enter into this last section of Matthew, and we see a Matthew who's always been focusing our eyes on who Jesus is and, and what he's done, we are now going to more zero in on those two questions in these last days of the Lord in his life. This Passion Week, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. So let's turn to God's Word here in Matthew 21. Let's pray for his enlightenment. Lord God, as we come before you this very morning, and God, we are excited each and every week that we can come and worship King Jesus. And Lord, as we walk through these Gospels, Lord, as we see who Jesus is, and Lord, what he has done, God, I pray it would change us. Lord, it would change our affections from the world to your Son, from the things that we want, Lord, to just do what you want. Lord, as we open the text before us, Lord, would it bend our wills to follow you, Lord, because, God, we need your help. I pray, God, as we uh, come before you, Lord, give us eyes to see, Lord, ears to hear clearly who you are, and Lord, what you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here in our text, I'll read first where we are, uh, verses 1 through 11. We're going to point out kind of three specific uh, narratives here. And almost if your Bibles have them almost split up, uh, uh, the introduction of reference to Zechariah already read and then kind of like the final scene there it's a natural uh, three-part uh, message here so let's begin here at, at verse one now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives then Jesus said to two disciples say to them go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey 
tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowds spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. This is God's word to us this morning. It is the week of the passion. That is the week that our Lord Jesus Christ would go to Jerusalem to suffer and die for our sins. And the disciples, like they have been all the way up until this point, are always seemingly a little unaware again of the significance of the things that Jesus is doing. And so Jesus very deliberately begins to make his way into the city of Jerusalem. And I want you to take a note of all of the actions that he does. He's always been very deliberate. He's always been very emphatic. He's always demonstrated to his disciples that he was the son of David, the Messiah, the son of the living God, who came to seek and to save the lost to save sinners. And each of his actions were very significant in his ministry. But now more than ever, there are indications that every single action that he takes during this final week is full of significance for both the disciples 2,000 years ago but also for you and me, these details matter. Because Jesus knows that the time, the time has now come before the foundation of the world when God knew he would send his son to the cross. And Jesus wants to make it very clear who he is and what he has come to do. And he once again is telling us the great significance of his suffering and his death before it finally happens. Up until this point, Jesus has predicted his upcoming death three times. So now I'd like for you to see two or three things with me this morning. In the first part of the passage, we focus our attention on who is Jesus the Christ the Messiah and what he does. Those are the first three verses. Then if you look at verse 4 and 5, we will see Jesus reminds us that he, it is he, that is, uh, that is who he is, and what he is rooted in the prophecy of God, even in the scriptures that we get from the Old Testament, that, that, that there's a prophetic nature of the Lord, and he's revealing himself about as he promised. And then lastly, verses 6 to the very end through 11, Jesus almost pushes a question upon us that we finally read for ourselves what the people were asking, which is, Who am I? You see in Matthew's words there, verse 10, when the people of Jerusalem asked the question, Who is this? 
you to see two and three things that we studied in this passage together. The first thing I'll put this on this first slide behind me here is that you and I as Christians need to live in the light of Jesus' keenly knowledge. He has a knowledge of above the rest, and, and I want to have a focus on his kingly knowledge. He governs over all things. He's, he's a sovereign king over all things. And not just 2,000 years ago, but right now in your life. You see, Jesus is going to command. He makes a command, and he says his disciples, on an errand, that only a king could send them on. And in fact, the process of giving this command gives a prediction as what will happen when they get there to the animal. And they carry out his words, like a king setting out his soldiers on a mission and bringing back the reward. And as we study this passage, I think we're also going to learn that we need to live our lives in light of the knowledge of Christ. You and I need to live our lives in light of the knowledge of who Jesus is. And hold that thought for a moment. Look at this passage together. This is the Sunday before his resurrection. Jesus and his disciples were making their way up to Jerusalem. Many other pilgrims are coming to Jerusalem too because of the high holy days of Passover. This is where like half of Israel is in Jerusalem at one point in time. So the city will swell with people coming over to celebrate together. And now we have Jesus at his appointed time to come to Jerusalem for everyone to see and witness these events. This is the triumphal entry of Jesus. That's what's recorded here in this passage. And there's a few things about why it's important that Jesus chose this particular moment to show up in time in history. He's saying something of himself. Who am I as the person, the Messiah, and what I have come to do? The first thing that we see in his triumphal entry is he's evoking a display of enthusiasm on the part of all the crowds that are with him. He knew that the enthusiasm of the crowds were going to provoke the religious leaders of the day. Secondly, we also see that Jesus chose this particular moment in human history to go up into Jerusalem and enter in this way He's actually provoking a crisis response. The religious leaders, the, the word we see in the Bible, the Sanhedrin, this is the, the, the Jewish uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, they've been trying to kind of get Jesus uh, arrested. They're, they're trying to stop him before he got to this point. And Jesus has broken through all their plans, and he says, no, you're, you're playing on my terms. And now I'm going to call you to have to think about what I have come to do. To say that it's not that you are the rulers of the kingdom, I am the ruler of my kingdom. Thirdly, we see this kind of messianic prophecy that's recorded here. And, and as uh, uh, Mark read from uh, Zechariah chapter 9, particularly verse 9, that very beginning, Jesus doesn't stop this crowd as they're singing the song of the sets and, and really sharing who he is and what the promised Messiah would do. O oh, daughter uh, of Zion, behold your king. He doesn't tell him to be quiet. And finally, as Jesus enters into the way of Jerusalem, he's once again showing us that Israel expected their Messiah to be like <clears throat> He was not going to be what, what they were thinking of. Not as a military king on a conquering conquest. They have this idea that Jesus would come in and overthrow the Roman Empire. 
expunge all the filthy Gentile Romans and then set up a new rule of righteousness. Once again, Jesus in this very passage, he's saying that their Messiah is going to come riding down to the town on a donkey. Jesus is teaching us that he is a king indeed. But he's not going to fit the expectations of the people of Israel. And so, for all of those reasons, Jesus enters into the Jerusalem. Those things are very important. And as we look at those first three verses, the focus of all of this is, is, is very Jesus' earthly ministry is finally drawing to a close. And he is no longer as he has been seeking obscurity and secrecy. He is in the open. Do you and I have Matthew uh, and many stories that have gone through John? I'm sure in your own Bible reading, many times. Knowledge of who Jesus is, that he is the Christ. Uh, he would meet a uh, uh, woman well. He would go heal someone who was sick. He would tell no one. For the time has not yet come. But the time is now. This is why the Gospel writers focus almost wholeheartedly, good chunks of their writings, on this very last week. There's seven days. And Jesus is making very openly known the claims about who he is. He is the Messiah. Why? Because Jesus wants to be widely known. He wants his claims to be widely known. He wants the events over the next seven days to be widely known. Later in the New Testament, there's a point in which Paul in his last years, who is testifying before the Roman authorities about who this Jesus is. You know these events. They are done in a corner. It's kind of like the whole uh, event of his entrance into Jerusalem, his crucifixion on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave. It's kind of like how you and I have experienced living through 9-11. People were there. You probably had a friend or a relative who was there. Witness what happened. And now we can not deny what we know is true. And Paul is saying, it's only been about a few years. This is the king that you need to bow down to. J.C. Ryle, who I love just as a commentator on all kinds of scriptures, has this to share with us today. He says, before the great sacrifice... For the sin of the world was offered up. It was right that every eye should be fixed on the victim. Jesus is focusing on our eyes, on his person and his work. You see that he asked for that little baby donkey, the foal. When he goes and claims that animal as a, a king would coming into the city, let my soldiers stay in your house, put my horses in your stable. This is only what a king would do. If someone did that in your house today, you would say, you have no rights to be in my house. But when you're a king, everything's yours. Everything follows your command. And Jesus has full knowledge of what will happen. So this passage reminds us that you and I, even now, not just 2,000 years ago, but today, we live under the eyes, under the gaze of the Lord Jesus Christ. It really is extraordinary. Jesus is saying to the disciples here in our text, you go into such and such village, and there will be a donkey and a young one waiting for you. Now, you will just take them and you'll bring them back to me. And oh, by the way, if one of the servants stops you, you just tell them, I need them. This is really remarkable. Jesus, knowing this already, he wasn't second-guessing himself. This wasn't a, I think, 
um, role of probability. He knows this. Why does Jesus know this? Because he truly is the Son of God. He really is the Savior for sinners. He's the King. He's the Lord of Lords. Do you and I realize that his eyes are on us right now? In the same way it was in that one situation. If he knows even the position of those animals, we can be sure that he knows our hearts. If he knows exactly where those two donkeys are, the mother, the child, how much more does he know everything that's on your hearts and your minds? Do you live in light of God knowing all that goes on in your life? He knows everything. And I would suggest that you sometimes, that we should live as if he doesn't know where we are. We sometimes want to live as if God doesn't really see the things that I'm doing in secret. We, we think we can kind of get away from him in a one particular area of our life. And if that's been you, you need to recognize God knows all things. This passage reminds us again that Jesus is a mission. He knows everything. And you and I should live that way. It's not to be out of fear. It's actually out of comfort. He's the one person that can relate to you. You can talk with. You're never alone when the Lord is always with you. Which brings us to the second point. The passage that we get from uh, Zechariah is that Scripture, the Bible, the Old and New Testament, prove his claims and reveals who he is and what he does. That's the big thing. Who he is, what he does. That's, it's throughout all of the gospel. In verses 4 and 5, not only do we have a kingly command, a prediction from the first three verses, but we have this fulfillment from scripture in this action of taking a foal and Christ then riding on that foal into Jerusalem. We see a prophecy fulfillment. Quite often, if you uh, flip through your Bible between uh, chapters 1 to 21, uh, you'll see that like, there's all these Isaiah prophecy fulfillments here and there. He's, he's, he's writing to a primarily Jewish audience, but he's writing to us, and he's saying, this is King Jesus who fulfills all the things that were to happen, and you couldn't help but you have to know this, this is the King of Kings, the promised one. And not only does scripture prove Jesus' claims, it reveals that he is the anointed one, the Christ. And you and I, if we have any preconceptions about Jesus, like some of the crowds did, we may need to step back from that and, and let the word of God tell us first what we need to know about Jesus before we allow tradition and men to tell us what we should know. About Jesus. The Bible needs to be your primary source, not what you see from the History Channel. And by every time there's Easter Sunday, it's always telling you how these things have, might have happened in some natural sense. They're missing the mark when they're not making Scripture their primary source. But as you look here at verses 4 and 5, the first thing that is stressed, as we see here, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming. The first thing that is stressed is that he is the people's king. Jesus is your king. He does not come as a conquering tyrant. He comes as the people's king. And Jesus comes for them, for their benefit. Not for his ego, but for their salvation. Secondly, you can notice that he comes gentle. 
Now, Jesus certainly had harsh words. We'll see in a few moments he's going to flip tables. But Jesus comes gentle. In gentleness and in peace and in graciousness, not in war. He comes to be a blessing. Just as we have from our call to worship that God would give you a double blessing. Not that his people would be oppressed again, but that Jesus would come to set people free from their sins, not to enslave them. And you can also notice in here he mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. In other words, he comes as a king, he comes in humility, and he comes on a humble beast of burden, riding on a borrowed donkey's colt. What a picture of that, the God of the universe. In the most humble position, the one who sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty now, came down into Jerusalem on a beast that he didn't own with no bridle, no saddle. It's a great picture of humility. That's what we have here from the text. Jesus is defining himself to us in Scripture. And you and I, we must not mold him to our thoughts, but we must submit our thoughts to his own definition. We need to know who Jesus is by what he says, not by tradition, not by man. And so lastly, we then see not just how Jesus here is, uh, is, we should live in light of this kingly knowledge, that we should, in fact, uh, see that the Bible proves who he is and what he's done. But when you get this information, when you are approached with this in the text, we finally get to the point where you are being pressed. Jesus' arrival demands a response. Lastly here, verses 6 through 11. Jesus is kingly, but lowly. Humble at the entrance of Jerusalem. He's now forcing a response to who he is. Everyone is witnessing this man after three years of public ministry. He's going to force all the people, the crowds, the Sanhedrin, the disciples, others onlooking, to finally say, who do you say that I am? But he's also demanding a response for anyone who reads this passage today. Us. Jesus actually enters into Jerusalem. There's the crowds. They begin singing to him in terms of Psalm 19, one of the more popular messianic songs that we get. It's one of the eight songs that are always sung as people go to Jerusalem during the Passover feast. Apologies, six. And this makes a big deal. The people who are singing this, the crowds, they're initially very enthusiastic. You would say, oh my goodness, I'm so grateful people finally see Jesus for who he is. It's not going to be, but five, six days later, the same people singing Hosanna in the highest are going to also be singing crucified. That How often do we see in our culture people celebrate the positive of Jesus? But to ask his lordship over our life, I'd rather him dead. Really, three basic responses from this crowd. Two of them are pretty explicit here. And another one we'll see just in the next week. But let me put all these responses kind of in one shot. Some people were very positive about Jesus, but they were very superficial in their knowledge and their support. The crowds. Very positive about Christ. That's what we have here in this picture. How do we know that? When they were asked who he is, what was the 
answered it. He is the what? The prophet of Nazareth. Who was it this time? They missed the mark. But clearly their support melts away one week later. We see that their knowledge of who Jesus is is superficial. The second response comes from Jerusalem itself, the city. So you have the crown and the city. What's their response? Complete ignorance. What's their question? Who is this? Jesus had been in Jerusalem before, and yet the response is, this person. You and I live in a country today where everyone has ready access to scripture, to the Bible. Where often more people don't, even though it is there. We are the church, 100,000 beyond Morningstar, telling people about the Lord. It's hard for people to actually deny who he is. Most people who go in to try and uh, say Jesus isn't who he is, and this is not what he's done. You think about people like Lee Strobel, who write a great book, end up coming to saving faith when they're trying to disprove him. They end up becoming followers of him. But then there's some people who just want to continue to just live and not even look at the truth. So there's superficiality, and then there's complete and utter ignorance. Matthew is making it very clear for you and I today. He's making it very clear that in any of these responses, they are all inadequate for your salvation. The next slide I have behind me here after point three is just, why do you think about this? Superficial knowledge of Jesus Christ? A positive view of Jesus, ignorance about Jesus, and if you oppose Jesus, all of those things condemn you. You need to deal with Jesus today. You and I, we need to bow our knee. It's the only true response is the only saving response for the world and for us we have to acknowledge jesus to be our lord we have to acknowledge him to be savior our savior we have to acknowledge that in only christ alone can you find salvation and nowhere else But if we are ignorant about him, or if we're apathetic about him, we are in the same fix as those who opposed him because he is your king. What could that look like today? I often see lots of people enthusiastic about particular preachers or pastors or churches, and they'll, they'll just go to wherever their itching ears will take them. They remind me of the crowds that would follow Jesus and then yet crucify him five days later. Such were some of you. Some of these people who live in complete ignorance. Reminds me of my pre-Jesus days. I'll show up at Christmas, I'll show up at Easter, and I'll just deny who he is. We got a lot of that out there. Condemnation goes for them. So if you think well of Jesus, but you have not embraced him as your Savior. And all across the land, there are many churches thriving with lots of people in them. But we suspect there are still people in those churches who think very well of Jesus, but they've never embraced him as their Lord and Savior on that last day. Only those who have embraced Jesus and have bowed the knee to him will find his mercy and the blessing he's promised and eternal salvation for which he died. And I pray as we look to who he is and what he has done, would you embrace Jesus today?
Father, as we gather here together, and Lord, the passage today is a, a great victory that we can celebrate, Lord, but Father, may we not be a, a people of itching ears, just going to where we ever hear a, a positive message. Lord, many churches today are stopping preaching on the realities of hell, the existence of sin. Lord, I pray, God, that you would open our eyes and make us to see the whole gospel, the full truth. Lord, that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Pray, Lord, if we've had itching ears and we just church hop around and uh, embrace cultural Christianity rather than Christ. Lord, help us to melt our hearts and turn us towards you. Pray, God, as we have many of those who, who remind me even of myself, just going to Christmas and Easter, many days of my life, not acknowledging you in my every other day, my every day. Lord, your omniscience tells me you know every part of me. Lord, may I give my whole life to you because you already know me. So, Lord, I pray that we would give the response. Lord, that we would bow our knees to King Jesus. And celebrate the kingdom that he has made and we look forward to the day of the new heavens and the new earth and Lord the new Jerusalem where you will rule and reign forevermore it's in Christ's name we pray amen stand with you sing this last hymn together ladies and gentlemen feel free to grab your